Namaskaram, everyone. My name Namaskaram. is Yuri. I have not gone live. Huh? This screen is showing. Namaskaram, everyone. My name is Yuri, and I'm delighted to welcome all of you to today's conversation on river revitalization. Unfortunately, the rivers of our country are dying. What else can one say if one knows that rivers that have flowed unencumbered for thousands of years suddenly decline by 40% or more in the short span of just two generations? Given that context, it's my singular privilege today to welcome amongst us the Honorable Minister for Environment, Forest, Climate Change of the Government of India, Shri Prakash Javdekarji. Namaste. The Honorable Minister has been at the forefront of reshaping and re-envisioning, as it were, India's ecological trajectory. And talking to him today is none other than our Sadhguru. I think it's in the fitness of things that this conversation is happening today on September the 3rd. Three years ago to this very date, Sadhguru had launched the Mammoth Scale Rally for Rivers Initiative, which garnered the support of an unprecedented 162 million people. Building on that foundation, on September 3rd last year, he launched Kaveri Calling, a project to save the very lifeline of South India to bring to you what's actually happening on the ground. The best way to do that is through a short video, which we will play now. And I then request Sadhguru after that for his opening remarks. Can we have the video, please? Mm -hmm. Hello. Give me some volume. So the vision is a very large vision for uh, these two states. In Karnataka, where we are stepping in for the first time, uh, the awareness generation phase was the most important phase. The most uh, preferred medium of communication nowadays with farmers has been WhatsApp. And second, it has been Facebook. Whenever we uh, reached out to uh, lakhs of farmers through these internet platforms, what we saw is that there is a requirement for the farmer to speak to someone. So we had set up a helpline number. When we talked to farmers, some of them just pour out their pain. But when I talk to them, they really like the enthusiasm. They say that, you know, if you are sitting somewhere else and you're speaking with each of us for 15, 20 minutes, how can I not go and pick up the sapling? Equally important uh, support that was happening uh, was the support from Government of Karnataka. So, pandemic has no way slowed us down, but uh, the dedication of our volunteers, risking their own personal health and well-being, they have been out there traveling, doing things. But above all, technology, media and the cooperation that we have from the forest officials and the agriculture ministry has made the difference. Namaskaram Prakashji and uh, Namaskaram to all of you, wherever you are. Uh, it's a... it's a privilege and 
I see this as a great possibility for uh, the future of the nation in terms of our ecology. When we say ecology, it is not an academic subject of some kind. It is the air that we breathe, the water that we drink, the food that we eat, the land that we stand upon. So without nurturing this, without taking care of this, imagining a life in a sky skyscraper is not a practical thing, which the whole world is realizing in a very hard way. But India, which still in many ways we are farm-based agriculture, where nearly sixty-five percent of the population is still connected with the land, I think this is appropriate time that we have these conversations and we take the nation in terms of policy and action that we don't cause the damage and then try to fix it. Some damage has happened, but still hundred percent of the population is not out of the soil, they're still in the soil sixty-five percent. So I feel this is the best time for this conversation. This is the best time for us to look at our policies, our actions and our commitment to what we want to make out of this nation, because nation is not uh, just an idea. Nation is people, nation is the soil upon which we stand. We call this mother soil in this country, in Tamil Nadu we call this Thai Manu. So, that which is the source of our existence cannot be walked upon with negligence and uh, wantonly, we cannot do this. We need to do this with some care and concern, knowing fully well we grow out of this soil and we go back into the soil. Having said that, uh, Prakashji, it's truly wonderful, wonderful to have you. And many steps that you have taken in the last few years has been very inspiring and supportive. Please, uh, you can start the... Yeah. Uh, Guruji, first, let me wish you today, as today is the very good birthday to you. And I hope that you will have full hundred years of active life. <laughs> that means a lot have... of work. <laughs> Too much work. work. <laughs> and I am senior to you in age, <laughs> but uh, you are senior in uh, many respects. What I why I was attracted to you was your inner engineering theory, millions of bright followers going to Rashram, Adi Yogi statue, your Sunday satsanga, and you must be recalling that in 2014 when I took charge of this ministry, I called you for Chintan Shivir, which we organized for officers, and you had come in Guwahati. Yes. And that time you gave them lecture on values as duty, why we should do good work. And what you have started as river revitalization is a very important program. Government of India has already decided and in Ministry of Environment and Forest, we have already prepared DPRs to the, for 13 rivers. Ganga is already under uh, uh, implementation. Jhelam, Chinab, Ravi, uh, Satlaj, Bias, Yamuna, Brahmaputra, Mahanadi, Krishna, Godavari, Kaveri, Luni, and Narmada. So, 13 important river systems in India are uh, taken. And more importantly, what we are proposing to this year, and that's an anecdote, and then I will stop. I was visiting a remote part near the jungle in Kolhapur district. Farmers were complaining that, oh, elephants come and destroy our crop. So I called forest officers and what can be done? So they were saying some technical. I said, we kill or what we do? So farmers said, no, 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 we'll never kill. That is India. That is India. We don't want anybody to be killed. As you know, in Australia, more than thousands of uh, camels were culled recently. But our farmer are saying, whose crop is destroyed, says that don't uh, kill the animal. What you do, why they are coming out? One explained to me why they are coming out, because they don't get enough fodder and water in jungle. Therefore, they come out. 
then i said to my officers that we will have water and fodder augmentation program in forest and now we have selected 28 forest in 28 states 10000 hectares each and catchment area treatment will be carried out and the dprs are being prepared through lidar surveys so latest technology and that we will have reached to value and uh, all a uh, uh, watershed uh, treatment plan that is because i also experience uh, in elevan villages in pune district i have done watershed development program successfully so this is our commitment and that is the point where we come together and i i always hold that ideation comes from people like you social workers actually those who are in the field government has to implement your power is ideation our power is multiplication that is what we are doing so guruji pranam uh what you said just now about creating fodder and water in the forest is very vital to see that this animal man animal conflict doesn't happen because uh, all of us have to live in the limited amount of land that we have and elephants have not increased their population in the last 70 years big time nor tigers have increased their population but as humans we have increased our population enormously so we are the ones who need to make the compromise not them <laughs> yes yes <laughs> because uh, when i was in school 60 years ago uh we had only 30 crore population and now we have 1.3 billion people so it's a huge difference addition of 100 crore on most constraints are there 2.5 percent land mass of the world Mm. Only 4% of uh, fresh rainwater resources, 16% of world's population, population mm. as well as 16% of cattle population, mm. both require land, water and for fodder or feed. And we have very limited space. In those constraints, we still have biodiversity of 8% of the world. So that is the Indian culture which are reflecting in our actions. Uh, but yes, sir, but as market developments and uh, industrialization and because our idea of developments unfortunately largely is driven by the Western markets and today we can call that as international markets, I think we are at a stage of development where we can still culture our own style of development, our own way of preserving what is valuable to this country so it's in this uh, effort that uh, we are trying to bring about certain basic changes in the way we farm the land and how we relate to the land and how we can uh, preserve this land. Because right now, most of the studies in the world say there is topsoil only for another 60 years of agriculture on this planet. Because every day, whatever we farm, we are taking out the topsoil and not able to put back the necessary organic content because organic content can only come from tree litter and animal waste. Both these things have become very scarce and the government of India has a mission to make at least 33 percent green cover on the pl on the... in the country. That mission if we complete, including the farmlands, because uh, 23 percent of the land is forest, not all of it is 100 percent forest, some are dense forest, some are medium, some are scrubby forests like this. So, putting back forests is a very big process and it's a very time-consuming process. But putting back trees on the farm, what it means is, from now onwards, the question of exploiting the forest for produce must go. Our need for timber and wood uh, that we have, which we naturally have for developmental purposes, must be grown on our own lands because right now the country is importing over 63,000 crores worth of timber and over 112 crores worth of... Uh, 112,000 crores worth of uh, uh, timber products. Why should I, our farmers not benefit? So converting part of the land into agroforestry will not only bring this uh, income to the farmer, 
which we have demonstrated with over 70,000 farmers going in for agroforestry. But the most important thing is the soil will become rich. For soil to be considered soil, the United Nations has fixed a thing, it should be a minimum of 2% organic content. But nearly 52% of India's soil has only point, point 0.5, 0 0.5 percentage of organic content. This is because only in the last 40 years, we are trying to grow crops with simply fertilizers. There is not enough organic content, there are no trees, there are no animals on the farm. We have to bring back trees and we have demonstrated this by doing this, the nutrient level will go up. I know the Prime Minister in his monkey bath, uh, he is... I have not heard the talk, but people have sent me the gist of his talk. And he is talking about making this month a nutrition year. See, if nutrition has to happen, the most important thing is the soil has to be rich. I know we will think of uh, midday meals, we will think of giving them B-complex uh, ta tablets and this and that, but that's all fine. That is all needed as an emergency measure because we have the largest nutrient deficient population in the world right now. But that can easily change by changing the soil quality because the studies show in the last 25 years, the vegetables in India have lost 40% of their nutrients. We need to put this back. This can be put back very easily with agroforestry. So right now this Kaveri calling is going in this direction. But you have already uh, announced, you preempted me by saying by 13 other river basins, you are uh, looking at that. We have made a, some kind of a project for eight rivers, but now you've gone ahead with 13 rivers. That is great, but we would like to see that and also assist you in this process. Because if we do just eight rivers, right now, just by doing Kaveri calling project, that is 2.42 billion trees in 83,000 square kilometers, will mean that 52, far 52 million farmers will benefit and 9 to 12 trillion liters of water will be sequestered and uh, 200 to 300 million tons of uh, CO2 will be sequestered. Right now, the promise that we have made at the Paris for uh, 2030 goals that we have, this is almost 8 to 12 percent of that. But if we do eight river basins, the numbers will go up to 34 billion tons of uh, 30 bo 34 uh, billion uh, saplings or trees, 130 trillion tons of uh, water, 130 liters of water, 2.9 to 4.3 billion tons of carbon and 74 million farmers. <coughs> this can go a long way. But right now, Kaveri calling is successful. One thing is the dedication of our volunteers, that is a different matter. Enthusiasm of the farmers, that's a different matter. One key bridging point was Karnataka government offered three-year subsidies for all the farmers per tree, 125 rupees they're offering. This is the bridge which has allowed the farmer to cross over from regular three-month, four-month economy to a long-term economy, which is an insurance for him. But this bridge is missing in the rest of the country. If you can look at it, sir, it will be fantastic. Yeah. And what you have said is absolutely right, Sadhguru. Agroforestry is the key element. And as you said, for a tree litter, what makes soil rich? And we have to first arrest the soil erosion and ensuring the planted uh, saplings survive very is very important a five-year maintenance plan is desirable by local committees what i want to say is why people who used to plant many trees on their made per paid lagta tha but wo khatam hua kyo? because the they were they started fearing that if I plant trees, the land will be declared as forest. So now we are giving assurance and in writing that your plantation will not be called as forest anytime now. Forest is what already forest is, but beyond that, we don't want to expand forest land and therefore your land will remain yours your crop will remain yours and you can harvest it 
and because then only he becomes economically feasible and then he grows more so that is the real idea and i'll just give one example in maharashtra in 1990 the horticulture program started 10 million plants used to be planted every year uh, prominent uh, then bear and mangoes and one more uh, fruit and every year 10 million are added more than 300 million in last 30 years and it has changed the very scenario and the farmers income all over and the trees the new varieties of trees of uh, fruits uh, are 10 to 15 feet high but that is what has changed the lives of millions of farmers so i think that's a, every time it should not be only a horticulture but regular trees also people are ready to plant and that is the basis of revitalizing the rivers because through because then only water percolates then only it flows finally and increase the base flow of river that is the function of forestry and now agriculture ministry and we and all other ministries are in line to take this as a mission with more quantities to be achieved every year sir uh, uh, prakash ji what you said uh, is very important that farmers should be assured that what he grows on his land is his right now there is a big issue about it in the last 6 uh, years time we have been pushing with all state governments that we are working with and also with the center and uh, center has declared but still this policy has not fully implemented in many states yet i think uh, that needs a push from yourself and i think it needs a push from the prime minister as a policy that we must declare we must clearly declare because right now there are laws british implemented laws that even the water as a resource in your land actually belongs to the government below 10 feet of depth or something like that so this may not be enforced but it is there in people's mind there is a fear <coughs> about this and uh, recently you have cleared this this is very important that you can fell and transport timber across the country this is something that we have been working at for a long time but uh, i'm glad that this is happening in your time that you have formed this digital platform where people can sell their timber on the digital platform and transport it wherever they want this is very very important because it's happened in the past in southern states where a farmer grows a tree in his land and for his need one day he cuts it and the activists will come and protest in front of his land and he gets arrested because of that pressure uh, the police will come and arrest him or the forest department comes and arrest him because he has cut a tree that he grew if there is no assurance that i can use what i grow on my land only then exploitation of forest will go only when people start growing timber on their private lands the need to go in stealth and you know exploit the forest as a because it's a crime who wants to commit a crime when they can do a legitimate business i'm asking if we can do a legitimate business which is profitable i don't think anybody wants to commit a crime when there is no room for legitimate legitimate business when there is no platform for legitimate business people are committing crime of going into the forest and cutting it down so this is a very important step that you have taken but still it is in various entanglements a little bit a little more clarity has to happen now under the agriculture ministry something is happening national mission for sustainable agriculture is a sub mission on agroforestry but the states when we approach them karnataka has done a fabulous job but when you approach many other states their problem is of funding now there are many other funding agencies both within the country and also outside the country which can be accessed by the government to promote agroforestry because right now in the un agencies the idea of agroforestry has caught on big time i have been pushing with them for the last few years and they also have come to this unccd is very committed towards this that this needs to happen especially kaveri calling they are looking at it as proof of uh, you know uh, 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 it's the real proof of the pudding is in making it happen if it happens in one river basin and shows results in 6 to 8 years time then we know this can be done everywhere else people will invest once the cc model scales up 
It is important this submission becomes a national mission on agroforestry. We... we need to approach it in a much more dynamic way because this involves 65 to 70 percent of the population in the country. The economy of the country could be greatly, greatly enhanced. And another important aspect of this is, before the pandemic happened, this unfortunate situation we are here, but uh, before this happened, it was estimated by... Twen by 2030, there will be over 220 million people migrating from village to city. So none of our cities are ready for this level of migration. But this migration can be controlled simply by having long-term crops on the land. If there are trees on the land, the farmer will not leave his land and go to the city. That'll never happen because it is standing wealth, it is money standing there. He is not going to leave it and go. So one simple way of keeping people in their natural habitats, where traditionally their families have lived for thousands of years, now suddenly they're going into a new place with all kinds of problems arising both for the city and for themselves, very degraded life in the slums in the city. This can be reversed. Not only that, we can create a reverse migration that lot of young people would like to go and live on land when it is full of trees and, uh, you know, and it is also an economic resource. Right now, most young people, I... I meet lot of young people who have this ideal at a certain time in their life. For a few years, everybody is dreaming of doing agriculture, but then they have a list of uh, people who have failed. City, they gave up their business, a job and went to do agriculture and how they failed. There used to be a saying, because I... when I was living on the farms, people used to tell me this, See, farmer is someone who makes money in the village and spends in the city. Agriculturist is someone who makes money in the city and spends in the village. Don't go there, you'll fail. This used to be the <laughs> philosophy. Yeah. But that can change if agroforestry comes in because tree-based agriculture is something that everybody can do. Many, many young people will invest themselves in agroforestry and this can be a game-changer in every way, particularly for the rivers, as you said. Without trees, there is no way to capture the rainwater. The only source of water we have in this country, 96% of the water is monsoon water. We have to see that it stays in the soil for 365 days. The average that the world bodies are saying, uh, the capacity of the soil in the world, the top soil in the world is eight times more, 800% more than all the rivers put together. That's the volume of water that the soil can hold. So our soil will be rich only when there is water in it. And our soil will <laughs> hold water only when there is organic content. If organic content has to be there, there has to be trees on the land. This we have to bring back as a national mission. Yeah. Sadhguruji, you will like to hear that there was a scheme called compensatory afforestation. Any new activity which is started in forest area particularly mining, they have to give money for compensatory afforestation. But that fund was kept in fixed deposits for 15 long years because of Supreme Court order. We changed the law in 2016. And after changing the law, last year, we have distributed 49,000 crore rupees to the state governments. And now states are submitting their working plan, action plan, and we are approving them. And they are going ahead with... Uh, for making degraded forest also into a good forest. Because after all, as you mentioned, UNCCD, we have hosted UNCCD COP14 mm -hmm. this year, and uh, we have taken up a world's largest target of converting and restoring 26 million hectares of degraded land. That we have already uh, taken up on as a challenge. And to that end, these CAMPA funds will be utilized, but that will be in the forest area. Out of forest, we want to incentivize people in every possible way, because first three, four years, when he doesn't get anything, he can have some intercrop, but still you have to finance him. So those also schemes are being worked out. 
Right now, Karnataka government has a very effective scheme in this direction. Uh, sir, if you can look at that policy, it's very, yeah. very good and supportive. That's why it's such a big success out there. Campa funds are going for afforestation, which is a good thing, but uh, they have recently included also urban afforestation. I do not know if it is uh, within my capacity to suggest to you if agroforestry can fit into this campa, but uh, because it will be cropped, there may be an issue about that. So, uh, uh, I mean, I'm just putting it, but there are other source, uh, fund sources, which are uh, like the, you know, uh, <coughs> uh, like the green uh, fund, uh, you know, green, international green fund. There are many other sources which have huge uh, volume of uh, funds available, but I don't think India has effectively uh, captured the international funding. Because in today's uh, economy, with this pandemic, we have many, many problems, there are many squeezes, many pressures on the economic structure of the nation. I think this is a time we must uh, uh, access these... Uh <laughs> these uh, fund sources outside the country, with you heading the... being the host for the camp, uh, COP14, uh, and further going two years, you are there on this... Uh, uh, this thing. So I think this is a very good time to do the Global Environmental Fund, Green Climate Fund, these things if we can access because massive amount of money is there with the right kind of projects if we go, particularly for agroforestry, if we go as a mission, I'm sure these funds can be accessed. You know, Government of India is definitely capable of that. I think that will be a very positive change because without incentive, shifting the farmer from his three-month economy to a lo more long-term economy is a very difficult thing to do. Yeah, I entirely agree. And Prime Minister himself is very much convinced that agroforestry is the way forward. And for agroforestry, he has given this slogan of Har made per paid. So on every bank of uh, this uh, border, boundary of uh, farm, you will plant trees. And elsewhere also, you can have agriculture of trees, crop of trees, because then only we can avoid the imports, which you also mentioned. Import to this tune, we are exporting the jobs. Instead, let us do ourselves the required commercial uh, timber here. We will create jobs here. And that is what is needed. And therefore, I believe that agroforestry and afforestation in vacant and available land where plantation can take place is the way forward and our government is committed to it. So both within forest, outside the forest, but on a large scale and private farms, all three avenues will be uh, incentivized to do that. And there only we will have achieving our carbon sequestration target, which we have taken up in our nationally determined contributions in Paris. So that is where we are leading to. As, uh, as I already said, sir, one thing is uh, about your commitment yeah. in Paris for this uh, 2030. Just the Kaveri calling project, when it's fully implemented, it will fulfill yeah. 8 to 12 percent. But as I said, we've worked out the details for eight rivers. But you have... Uh, you are working on 13 rivers now. Even these eight rivers, if we fulfill, we will... we will fulfill this promise 120 percent or 230 percent. We will go well over the promises that we have made to the world. If only this agroforestry takes off, because India is a land of agriculture, most of the land is in the farm of the farm... Uh, in the hands of the farmers, that's where it should go. But farmer lives in a certain kind of fear... fear, which comes from the British era, where, uh, you know, even today, unfortunately, our district administrators are called collectors, because the only thing they did during British era is collect, forcefully collect taxes. Even today, unfortunately, our administrators are still referred to as collectors, but that fear of the government official is there. What is the fear? If I find something valuable in my land, they will come and take it. This is the fear. I would uh, request you that if the Prime Minister himself can declare Whatever wealth you grow in your land, whatever wealth you find in your land is yours 
maybe government will tax it, but it is yours. This assurance must come, unfortunately, how deep-rooted this fear is, most people don't understand, but there is a deep-rooted fear, if I find something, if I find gold in my land, government will take it, confiscate it. Why? Government can tax me, unless it's a civilizational matter, that is, you dug in the land and you found a Harappa or Mahajandaro in your land, then government can take it, that's a different matter. But everything else must belong to the owner of the land. Right now it doesn't. If this one assurance comes in terms of, you know, a clear statement from, uh, from the central government that whatever you grow in your land, it doesn't matter what you grow, if you grow gold on your trees, it belongs to you. Maybe if you're making a lot of money, we will tax you, but it belongs to you. This assurance has to come because this fear will not allow a farmer to go for anything long term. Because policies may suddenly change, if my teak tree becomes this big and suddenly it's worth a few lakhs, then the government says, oh, this is a nice tree, this belongs to us. This fear is there, a clear, clear statement, not in the form of many, many dozens of policies which common people don't understand. Just a clear statement, what you grow on your land belongs to you, has to come, sir. It's very, very important. Yes, very good suggestion, Sadhguruji. And we will definitely be declaring it in uh, very clear terms and through advertisements also and communicating in all possible ways to convince farmers that this is the final right. And whatever you grow in your... Uh, as an agriculture or as a trees, it, it belongs to you and it will never be declared as forest and you can harvest it use it, transport it, sell it, and grow it more. Because Very that important. is how carbon sequestration will happen, and that is how the forest will grow and will not be importing nation, but an exporting nation at certain point of time. But uh, this will... this should not come in the form of uh, 12 different uh, policy changes, small, small changes. Maybe oh. it means the same thing, but the common man doesn't understand this. Yes. Because everywhere we go, we confront this fear. Clear statement from the leadership, if it comes, it'll become... It'll, it'll make the work very easy. Today also on your forum, we are making this very clear that anything farmer grows on their own farm in form of any kind of tree, it will belong to him. Because in sandal also, as you know, the anecdote is that sandal was... is our heritage. It's our pride. And Australia... Now Australia is, is growing from, it. <laughs> and now from, we are importing from Australia. <laughs> Why sandalwood farming has gone? Because you cannot cut the sandalwood tree. So these kinds of restrictions we are removing, already removed, but we'll make very clear announcement so there should be no confusion and people will be assured that this is our final guarantee. Uh, if we don't wake up, sir, and really act on this, I'm sure... I'm, I'm... I know many, many things you have done, policy changes which are significant, but I'm just joking. Uh, if we don't act like this now, in this generation, if we don't act, we will be also uh, importing yogis from, yeah. I don't know, Timbuktu. <laughs> because no. already people think yoga started in California. <laughs> no, but Sadhguru, you and some of our yogis are going world over and they are regarded and therefore, uh, I am very certain that India will not be importing yogis. It will actually <laughs> be sending its yogis to spread the message of Indianness. No, a significant step was uh, Prime Minister initiating this uh, International Day of Yoga has done wonders to, to that area. Why I'm bringing yoga into this process is because... Uh, because yoga has become just a simplistic practice in many parts of the world. But yoga means union. Union means we, as we walk on this land, we understand we are a part of this soil. As we breathe, we understand we are a part of this atmosphere. As we drink and eat, we understand we are a part of everything around us. Experientially, to know this is yoga. So this yoga needs to happen to every farmer, to every minister, to every official, to every common person. Everybody must know this much yoga that 
the water that you drink, the rivers that are flowing, the trees that are standing in the forest, they are all a part of you. As you breathe, what you exhale, the trees are inhaling, what the trees are exhaling, you're inhaling. One part of your lungs is out there, hanging out there on the tree. If this much yoga was there in our life, uh, environment, we don't have to worry, it'll, nef it'll definitely happen. <laughs> yeah, in our tradition, we call this a charachar srishti. So, trees, chalne wale prani, na chalne wale prani bhi, sab milke prakurti hai, prakurti aur manushya ek hi hai. Ye pancha tattva se bani dunia hai. So that people understand and therefore, uh, these are the Indian thoughts and therefore we have more biodiversity than many other countries. And we, because we worship animals, we worship rivers, we worship, and I, have, I must quote, what are the citizen actions? I used to go to Chitrakut many times for meeting Nanaji. Mm -hmm. And I had also adopted one village nearby. So there is Mandakini River flowing. Every Sunday, thousand volunteers used to take up 100 meters of reverse patch and go deep and unclog the whole river. It was becoming really a wonderful change in the river. Within one year, it was changed picture all, all the way. So this is how citizen actions also can uh, help in revitalizing the rivers. So one important step towards agroforestry, particularly Kaveri calling, keeping that in mind. Uh, right now, uh, Karnataka and Tamil Nadu and Pondicherry are involved in this uh, Kaveri basin, which covers uh, 83 to 84,000 square kilometers, 5.2 million farmers. So where we are working, we have, we have a commitment for 12 years. But what I see is state governments are struggling to fulfill this. Right now, they are giving the subsidies, but in the next three to five years, they may have trouble giving the subsidies. I would like the Environment Ministry to look at it kindly towards states which are taking proactive action towards this to save the soil of this land. Bharat's soil is uh, our mother. So to save this, they have taken the necessary steps. If you can uh, keep an eye on that and see that their funding resources uh, are replenished, so that they can continue the support they're giving to the farmer. It'll make a huge difference, not just for this region, for every other region, because you have 13 rivers now on your agenda. Yeah. And in all those 13 rivers also, we have prepared the DPRs exactly like what you have done in Kaveri, that there will be patches which are available, will be, pla will have pla be planted trees, will be grown, uh, and will be increasing the basic flow of river. And there is one more danger also, sand mining. This sand mining is destroying at many places because if you don't mine the sand, then it will be clogged, it will be floods. But if you uh, mine more, then also the river dies. And therefore, now we have set up the new standard operating procedure and the new guidelines for mining the sand so that on a sustainable basis. So only ISRO maps taken mm -hmm. in September will tell us that how much and where the extra sand is deposited. Only that and at that place only uh, the sand can be removed. And with a barcoded receipt and many other facilities done, it will really stop the malpractices and we will save our rivers because that is also one important aspect. That's, that's very important, sir. We made a small, uh, very simple solution for the sand mining in the Rally for Rivers recommendations, yeah. which has been uh, given by the central government as a uh, recommended policy for all the 28 states now. It's official. But still, I don't think everybody has looked at it. The important thing is what we are suggesting is, you, you can come up with your own numbers. I'm talking numbers off the cuff. See, for example, right now there's an individual house builder and there is massive mega builders who are developmental projects, like roads and bridges and, um, you know, multi-storied buildings. This is a different level of development. Right now, if we just fix this, that if your building is below 5,000 square feet, you can mine 
the river for sand, but no machinery. By hand, you can take your truck or tractor and load it by hand and bring it out. Don't take machinery because once you take machinery, you damage the river significantly. So Maybe. no allowing of machinery into the rivers, but people can hand mine it. See, the simple f uh, local farmers have been arrested in our area because he wants some sand for agricultural purposes. He takes his tractor to load it up, right there he gets arrested, his tractor gets confiscated, months on end he runs back and forth. See, this kind of uh, enforcement of law will create a discord and everybody will become a lawbreaker over a period of time. Because where does he go for that? You know, he wants a mixture of soil and clay, I mean sand and clay, which goes into his agriculture land. Don't stop him from that, it's okay. I'm saying big builders, buildings beyond 5,000 square feet, they must go for artificial M sand or whatever different things are there. For this also, we must be practical and say, make a policy, a clear policy like this. If you're over 5,000 square feet and no machines in the river, that is 100 percent, you, you have to produce your own sand. So give them, let us say, twenty-four months or thirty months to set up their units. Whatever, if some support is needed, land is needed, support is needed, subsidies are needed, something you give because this has a long-term impact. Now we just say no sand. Obviously, we're making sand a premium product. To a point where they're killing the policemen, hundreds of policemen in the country have been killed, revenue officials have been killed because in the night they're mining sand and sand is like gold. Its value is so high, people will kill for it. So the way to do it is you take away the market. That in the market, you cannot use the river so as sand in big buildings, in major constructions. If that is done, once the market is gone, people will find other ways of manufacturing it. The people who are right now smuggling sand will go into manufacturing sand because they're only trying to provide a product that the country is demanding, isn't it? And now people have idealistic way of, no, you should not touch the river. Well, I have built my house, I am happy. When you want to build your house, I say, don't do sand mining. This is not going to work, I'm saying. So you will pay premium for the sand. Once you pay premium for the sand, you are encouraging crime, big time crime. It is happening all over the country. So simple thing is, below 5,000 feet, without machinery, you can take sand from the river. Over 5,000 feet buildings, you cannot take and no machinery in the river at any cost. If this much is fixed, it will solve the problem considerably. I entirely agree and this is, as we call in our parliamentary language, suggestion for action. I have already noted, we'll deliberate and we'll communicate to you also what we are going ahead with. Thank you, sir. But uh, that is uh, what we will definitely take action on because what you said, both the points are important that if you put machines into riverbed, then they destroy the river. And two, there has to be some restrictions for using river sand. Huh? You can use the seashore uh, sand, that is a different thing because what M sand you are getting in Bangalore and Chennai is coming from seashores of Thailand and other places. So it is coming that way only. So we have large amount of things. Whenever I went to Andaman Nicobar, there is tremendous sand all over, but because of our restrictions, we cannot take away even a single uh, but for un uh, construction in Andaman, it's very difficult to get sand. They have to purchase from other countries. So that is the position there. And we will have to come out of these uh, obnoxious rules which, were pre which are prevailing. And then we can have a natural progress on your suggestions that no machinery and more big, bigger constructions, they will have to go in for manufacturing the sand. So one important aspect, I would like to just touch on it. This is, uh, maybe it's coming under various ministries, but I just want to bring it to your notice. One understanding, even when I've spoken to various chief ministers, everybody thinks any water flowing from a river to the ocean is a waste. We must control it. So what essentially you are saying is, we, one thing is you want to destroy the delta regions. By building more dams and barrages, you destroy the delta completely. 
which has happened to the Kaveri Delta already. Kaveri Delta used to be one of the richest. Three crops they were growing, now they're growing only one, because five months in a year, water is not even touching the Delta. Nearly yeah. 300 to 400 kilometers, before it, the ocean itself, it's dry, completely dry. Nothing flowing in Kaveri. So in one Ka important... No. Yes, in Kaveri. Please, please. One important aspect of this is, there is a whole mixed ecosystem along the coast of the Indian Peninsula, which amounts for 7,400 plus kilometers. There is an ecosystem of fresh water and marine water, which is like a border along the uh, peninsula. If this ecosystem is destroyed, which is already being significantly destroyed, particularly in Tamil Nadu, we are noticing this, the uh, marine water ingress into the soil is happening up to 55 to 56 kilometers it's come. Some of the geologists say across the 7,400 kilometers up to 80 to 100 kilometers it, it, it can come inside if the rivers don't flow into the ocean. At least 30 to 40 percent of the river must go into the ocean as base flows. They have to go. Otherwise, if let us say the worst case scenario is 100 kilometers into ingress, I mean uh, it is 7,400 kilometers into 100, that many, which is almost like another partition, we will lose that much land yeah. completely. We will lose that much land if marine water comes. So this base flows must flow into the ocean, this misunderstanding should go. And before, uh, because the time is running out, I would like to touch on this important aspect, which uh, Prime Minister has right now declared that this is a nutrition month. So in terms of nutrition, the human nutrition is very connected to the richness of the soil in a very big way. That is from, you know, like some of the studies show that from 1999, uh, from 1950 to 1999, 43 different vegetables and fruits, a significant decline in protein, calcium, phosphorus, uh, iron riboflavin, that is uh, mainly uh, vitamin B2 and vitamin C over the past half a century has happened, a significant decline. Some of the studies in India show in the last 25 years, the nutrients and the micronutrients in the vegetables that we are eating today is 40% less than what it was 25 years ago. So because of this vegetarian diet, slowly everybody is declaring is no good. When the, all the Western doctors and countries are declaring you must eat fresh vegetables, in India doctors are suggesting you must eat meat, otherwise there is no nourishment. Well, there is unfortunate reality in this, the vegetarian meals that we are eating do not have enough nourishment. This is simply because the necessary organic content and richness of the soil is missing. What should be minimum 2% organic content has come to 0.5%. Without agroforestry, I don't see a solution as to how we will provide nutrition for this nation. Nutrition does not just mean giving them extra vitamin pills and iron pills and zinc pills and all this stuff. We need to enrich the soil. Enriching the soil must become part of the nutrition mission. Now that this month has been declared as a nutrition month, which is a very, very important focus because I've been continuously talking about this for the last thirty years. When you walk through an Indian village, I'm talking about reasonably well-to-do states in South India. Well, what is the condition of other states? which are Bimaru states is a different matter. In southern India, where the states are considered well-to-do, agriculture is successful reasonably. Here, if you walk into the village today, sixty percent of the people, their skeletal system has not grown to full size because they're eating food, but there is no nourishment. They're eating... their staple food has become rice, chili, onion, tamarind in south. In the north, wheat, chili, onion, you know, uh, when I was in uh, UK, at that time, there was a big galata going on in the Indian media about the onion prices. They were yeah. trying to dislodge your government because of the onion prices. <laughs> yeah. So I was in a... I was with a family in UK and they're asking, what is this thing about the onion? Why is it so important? I said, it's our staple diet, unfortunately. So <laughs> even if the stomach is full, there is no nutrient simply because the land is not rich. So as a part of the nutrition policy, Agroforestry is a prime aspect of it. Please uh, keep this in your mind, sir. Sure.
agroforestry is the base for in, uh, the, increasing the nutrient because you are enriching the soil unless you enrich the soil you won't get vegetarian uh, or vegetable meals uh, to be nutrient and therefore uh, already we have taken up rashtriya poshan mission national nutrition mission under which feeding those who are uh, under nourished but also feeding nutritious food food with more nutrition is also ensuring and one point which you said was also important about flows to the sea shore sea because otherwise saline water will come in and therefore we have to ensure e flows that is very important we have given new slogan aviral dhara nirmal dhara swachh kinara to ye saaf sutra sea shore uh, or river bank nirmal dhara uh, that is clean water and aviral dhara is continuous uh, environmentally uh, sustainable environment to go <laughs> of the subject sir a little problem is also all these yeah. complicated uh, slogans we in south india don't understand a thing I agree. Said in the local languages, <laughs> I yes. know we have many languages. I know all of you cannot come up with slogans for all the languages, but in some way it should come because the peninsula is largely non-Hindi speaking, the peninsula part of India. I agree. Yeah, and I if we don't understand, if the people, common farmer, does not understand what this slogan is all about, then uh, there is no involvement. Without their involvement, there is no mission of any kind. So it's also important. It's communicated. always whatever environmental things or nutrition things communicated by the government please ensure as you communicate in hindi immediately communicate in other southern indian languages so yes. that they are not left out of the whole mission i have started new india samachar from 15th august and we are printing that into all indian languages so everybody will get the copy in his own language and that that is what is needed but uh, government circulars are translated into regional languages the issue is slogans also need to be converted appropriately yes. into regional language i i take your point very important one right now uh, the un agencies are saying uh, over 70% of the children below 3 years of age are anemic 55% of the indian women are anemic so in a way if we don't make sure that the women and children are well nourished we are make we are kind of producing an underdeveloped generation for the future the only strength we have is our population if we have a healthy energetic inspired population we will be a miracle if we have a weak unwell kind of population then we will be a great disaster so this uh, nourishment month is very important to bring awareness but in terms of action without enriching the soil there is no way to enrich human life so if we must uh, people ask me sadguru what are the three most important ingredients for environment i said soil soil and soil because if this 39 inches of top soil is well taken care of almost 95% of the life on the planet just lives on this including us so this soil must be maintained the soil of this sacred land called that is called as bharat if we maintain the richness of this soil the future of this nation is definitely assured thank you very much for your participation in this thank i you. think uh, ibrahim tia uh, your uh, friend and uh, also we have yes. been connected with him from unccd he has sent a message uh, if yuri can bring that on that will be uh, nice um, indeed this has been a very insightful and dare i say enlightening conversation I would like to thank the honorable minister and Sadhguru for making this possible for us. It seems to me that um, to make the progress on all the multifarious fronts that both of you have talked about, uh, policy changes are of course required, uh, and it's heartening to see uh, how the government has been actually moving and all the plans of the government so far. But for me, I think I'm, I keep getting reminded by something that Sadhguru always talks about, which is that uh, we need to think about. not just uh, what is happening out there but what can i do to become part of the solution and not just be part of the problem and as i think about that we have the living example of our nadi veeras 
ISHA volunteers who, as we speak, yeah, in the middle of this COVID environment, are actually doing an incredible task of planting 11 million trees to take care of many of the issues that the Honorable Minister and Sadhguru have just talked about. So on that uplifting note, I would like to close, as Sadhguru mentioned, with a message from Ibrahim Saab, who is the Executive Secretary of UNCCD. He is one man who has a perspective view on the entire world. And it will be instructive to see what he has to say as his definitive view on this entire matter. So could I have uh, that video, please? And we'd like to close with that. Namaskar. Today, one year ago, we were in New Delhi celebrating the 14th session of the Conference of the Parties to the United Nations Conference. Mm. Heads of states, have, ministers, heads of is not there. agencies and intergovernmental bodies, youth, local governments, business leaders and representatives from non-governmental organizations. This was one of the last international conferences of such a magnitude organized by the United Nations before the COVID-19 pandemic change a way to interact with each other. The present pandemic has forced us to reassess our relationship with nature. How we treat nature contributes to pandemics. Desertification, land degradation and drought are linked to the loss of natural habitat and the spread of diseases from animals to humans known as zoonosis. COVID-19 in one such disease. The rate of future zoonotic diseases emergence and re-emergence will be closely linked to the evolution of our relationships with nature. This is the reason why we are promoting the vision of social contract for nature. Social contract for nature demands new global and national governance models based on rights, rewards, and responsibilities, explicitly recognizing the fact that future of the future of humanity, economic growth, and nature are completely dependent on one another. In his opening remarks at the landmark UNCCD COP14, His Excellency Prime Minister Modi demonstrated his leadership in the area by sharing his plan to restore 26 million hectares of degraded land by 2030. Such program will not only improve livelihoods of millions of poor people, but it will be one of the most concrete contributions to the post-COVID recovery in rural areas. Next Monday, we at the UNCCD will be organizing a ministerial conference on the Africa's Great Green Wall. The Great Green Wall is an African-led initiative designed to transform the lives of millions of people by restoring 100 million hectares of land. It's an epic 8,000 kilometer long mosaic of trees, grasslands, vegetation, and plants, the continent to restore degraded lands and help the region's inhabitants produce adequate food, create jobs, and promote peace. The Great Green Wall is a symbol of hope in the face of desertification, one of the foremost challenges of our times that has impended livelihoods in the Sahel and turned the region into one of the poorest in the world. It is already bringing life back to Africa's degraded landscapes at an unprecedented scale, providing jobs and reasons to stay for millions who leave its path. Once complete, the wall will be the largest living structure on the planet, three times the size of the Great Barrier Reef. A year ago, the Isha Foundation embarked on another massive project, the so-called Kovri Calling, with the aim of restoring 83,000 square kilometers in the Kovri Basin in southern India. The project was launched during the UNCCD COP14. We were delighted to hear all about it from Satguru's first hand at the convention. This project aimed at supporting farmers
to plant close to two and a half billion trees through agroforestry projects in their private farmlands over the next 12 years. Isha Foundation has designed this project in the Kovri River Basin to help recover degraded land while at the same time sequester millions of tons of CO2 equivalent. Kovri calling could also be a large scale project that helps improve the living conditions of the most vulnerable populations while rehabilitating the land that sustains all of, all of us. In India, experts ex estimate that 30% of the land is under threat of desertification and land degradation. Yet, the country needs to feed a population close to 1.4 billion people today. Massive deforestation has brought us a severe convergence of problems, including land degradation and desertification. To address this, one of the most powerful solutions could be a large-scale land rehabilitation. Agroforestry, for example, targets at once land and water, food and nutrition, social and economic inequalities, biodiversity loss and climate change. I sincerely hope that countries around the world see the potential of land restoration and river revitalization as solutions to support our planet. In closing, I want to congratulate the Isha Foundation for the first anniversary of the Kovri calling and wish you all the best in the implementation of this ambitious project. Thank you.